Welcome everyone. My name is Raza Rumi and I'm the director of Park Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College. Our webinar this afternoon focuses on an important film by Professor Idrisu Morakapai called The American Street. And, the, and this event is being co-hosted by the Park Center for Independent Media and the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival of FLEF in short. Uh, uh, with the collaboration of Cinemopolis, our local art cinema, and a pillar of Ithaca's cultural life. Uh, the Park Center for Independent Media investigates media produced outside their traditional corporate systems, and FLEF is an annual film festival hosted at Ithaca College and the Cinemopolis, uh, which interrogates the international interconnections of global and local systems. Our center strives to promote and showcase indie media productions of such quality as Professor Morakapai's vitally important film. This documentary engages with sustainability on economic, social, and political levels that FLEF seeks to highlight. And its topics of racial violence and gentrification are even more important in 2020. Um, it is an honor, therefore, to present the America Street and the discussion which will follow shortly. This session will be moderated by Dr. Pat Patricia Zimmerman, who has been the moving spirit behind this event. Dr. Zimmerman is a professor of, of screen studies at the Ithaca College and co-director of the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival. Over to you, Dr. Zimmerman. Uh, thank you, Raza, and thank you to the Park Center for Independent Media and Cinemopolis. Um, I'd like to thank PCIM and Raza for collaborating with FLEF to host this very important and urgent event. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for coming to celebrate with us in this webinar the world theatrical premiere of Idrisu Mora Kapai's new feature length documentary, America Street, a film that asks us to consider sustainability and race and people in place in an extremely uh, insightful and urgent kind of way. Cinemopolis, our local art cinema in Ithaca, has also collaborated to host this world theatrical premiere. Uh, making the film available to anyone, anywhere in the world via the Cinemopolis Virtual Cinema Portal. And we feel that this is uh, creating a new way to put uh, important documentaries into the world. Our format today will be this. Our panelists will each share uh, a short five minutes of opening remarks on America Street. There are uh, five panelists. We ask attendees uh, to please post their questions in the Q&A on Zoom. Please do not use the chat for your questions. You can use that to talk to each other and to make other kinds of comments. We will uh, open two questions after the presentations for approximately 50 minutes. Then we will conclude in our uh, traditional uh, FLEF and PCM format with short takeaways from each of the panelists um, reflecting on our 90 minutes uh, together. Um, I'd like to start with our first panelist, the film director of America Street, uh, my uh, beloved and uh, most honored colleague, uh, Drisu Mora Kapai. I'd like to introduce him uh, before his remarks. Uh, professor Idrisa Mora Kapai is Assistant Professor of Media Arts, Sciences and Studies at Ithaca College, and also a award-winning filmmaker with international acclaim. Born in Benin, West Africa, Professor Mora Kapai is internationally recognized for his social documentaries which tackle issues such as post-colonial African societies, African migrations, and diasporas. Professor Mora Kapai's filmography includes the important uh, feature-length documentaries, Indochina, Traces of a Mother, Arlit, The Second Paris, and Si Guriki, The Queen Mother. These films have been screened at festivals throughout the world, including the Rotterdam International Film Festival, the Berlin International Film Festival, 
the Cannes International Film Festival via Institut Francais. And these films have received numerous international prizes and awards. In 2013, uh, Professor Maura Kapai received the Prince Klaus Award. Idrisu Maura Kapai. Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Thank you very much really for making this possible. Thank you for, to all of you for all your contribution. I'm really, uh, I really appreciate it. Right. So um, I, I wanna talk about the making of uh, America Street. I shot for America Street in Charleston where I lived for two years from 2013 to 2015. In these two, two years, the city um, never stopped to perplex me. Charleston is known as a, a splendid and attractive tourist, tourist city. But the sad reality is uh, that uh, uh, the city is extremely segregated. And the history of the Old South is still very present there. Uh, you have a white, fairly wealthy population opposed to an impoverished African-American population, African-American population. Uh, there's almost no black middle class. And you see this reality reflected everywhere. Okay. Close to this charming downtown, you find desolate black neighborhoods. In downtown, local blacks appear mainly as subord in subordinate positions. Downtown Charleston triggered in me a strange feeling as if under all that beauty hid a haunting, ugly secret. I think it was this contrast between apparent beauty and something really ugly that first intrigued me to make this film. Another interesting thing that, that happened to me when I lived in Charleston was uh, that one, whenever I looked at the black population, in my mind, I saw West Africans. I saw Senegalese, Sierra Leoneans, or Beninese. Then I learned about Charleston's particular connection to West Africa. 40% of the Africans that arrived as slaves in North America came through the port of Charleston. Most came from the rice growing areas of West Africa. I think there is no other place in this, is this West African heritage more evident than, than there. And the local Gulagishi population is very much aware of this heritage. What shocked me when I learned about the importance of Charleston for the history of US slavery was that nothing in town really indicates that it's history. There's no memorial, no material sign that reminds of this fact. However, all over the historical downtown, the streets and bridges carry the names of the heroes of the Confederation. It was clear that the history of slavery, but also the history of this rich and substantial uh, connection to West Africa war was willfully suppressed. All these different paradoxes in the city triggered in me this urge to make a documentary film there. And when I met Joe Watson, my main character, I was immediately captivated by his personality, his warmth, compassion, wisdom, all reminding me of the elders I had left behind back home. And unlike my other films, I began shooting without any preparation, no crew, no script. I merely observed Joe in his store. I followed him to his numerous activities. I did the camera myself and I've never, that I've never done before, but it allowed for an intimacy that you can attain with the crew. Very quickly, my camera and I became part of the environment of Joe's store. People forgot about me. For almost three months, I filmed from morning to evening. I did, I did not think about the structure at that point, and that was decided due to, during the editing process. I just wanted to get an uh, in-depth understanding of the community and their effort to resist the injustice around them. And then the Water Scott killing happened, which add another layer of, uh, of the daily struggle of the community. So 
I also began to follow a, a couple of other characters I met in the neighborhood, in the city, in these days. So I stay here. Right. Are you done? Or is yeah, that... I'm done. I'm done. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm but sorry. Now. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm um, uh, thank you so much, Adrisu, uh, for that, um, for those remarks on uh, the film. Um, uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor R. A. Judy. Um, uh, professor Judy is Professor of Critical and Cultural Studies in the Department of English at the University of Pittsburgh, and he is a member of the Boundary 2 Editorial Collective. A comparatist, his work has spanned many areas from contemporary African Arabic literature and culture to hip-hop and Black studies. His publications have included uh, dis Forming the American Canon, the Vernacular of African Arabic American Slave Narrative, uh, and articles such as The Question of Nigga Authenticity and uh, Restless Flying from Tuni Tunisia to Haiti, uh, a Black Study of Revolutionary Humanism. His most recent book, Sentient Flesh, Thinking in Disorder, Poesis in Black is being released uh, in October, uh, just next month, by Duke University Press. Professor Judy. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank uh, Patricia for uh, having organized this. And uh, uh, really importantly, I want to thank Idrisu for having produced a truly remarkable film, which I've, I've seen through many of its stages. I want to speak very briefly about the importance of this film, American Streets. Uh, um, its importance as a, a cinematographic work of art, but also its importance in this moment in time. Uh, one of the characteristics of Idrisu's films from Indochina to Ali is the way in which the protagonist of the film is the community at large, the place, the dynamics. So while Joe Watson is the principal character, in the way the, the, the film has been shot with the performance of headshots and close-ups, and then significant cuts to wide shots and long vistas of, of different areas of the city, becomes the protagonist is Black Charleston. What becomes the protagonist is not just the dynamic of the life, but the, that life has been lived that way actively for a long time. So that when the Walter Scott episode appears in the film, appears not as a defining episode, which it should not be, but as a disruption in that flow of life, which of course becomes a principal theme throughout the film. So the resonance between the processes of gentrification and this act of police violence. Some, and a connection really very poignantly brought to bear in the scene in the town hall meeting with the discussion about development and gentrification, where it's very clear that the councilman who's talking is not speaking the same language as the community members and is not at all in touch with community members thereby instantiating the segregation that the film so wonderfully explores. There are two shots that I think frame this nicely. And, and they're the opening shot, the establishment shot. But it returns at the end. And those are the shots where we see fixed camera down the street, looking at the bridge that overshadows East Charleston. And then we come to the storefront of the for that Watts has been in for 57 years. And then there's the closing shot, which I think is profoundly symbolic of what the whole thing, film has been about. We close with a close-up of Watts reading in the store, backing away, and again we have this shot of the storefront, now at twilight, with the, the light shining out of it, 
so that we get a fundamental sense, a profound sense, a beautiful depiction of how that store has been a beacon for the community. This has been a film that I would put in the same category cinematographically as Barrett's films or, or as Daughters of Dust talking about the same area where we get to actually before us the rhythms and patterns of black life in its actuality, in its daily existence. This is a film that will go down as one of the most important about black America, I think, that has been produced in the past 10 years. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Judy, for those powerful comments and insightful reading of the visual structures of the film. Um, the next speaker is Brett Bossert. Uh, Brett Bossert is currently the executive director of Cinemopolis, Ithaca's member-supported art house cinema. Uh, Bossert has spent two decades in arts administration, serving in leadership positions at community organizations such as the Community Arts Partnership of Tompkins County, the Hanger Theater Company, and the Cayuga Museum of History and Art. He holds degrees in screenwriting from Ithaca College and then in popular culture studies um, from Bowling Green State University, a graduate degree. Bossert has worked extensively in fostering a collaborative arts sector, serving on grant panels for the New York State Council on the Arts, the board of the New York State Alliance for Arts Education, and currently as vice chair of the Strategic Tourism Planning Board of Tompkins County. He was recently selected to be part of the transitional working group for the Art House Convergence, an association, uh, a national association dedicated to advancing excellence and sustainability in community-based mission-driven media exhibition. And Cinemopolis, under Brett's leadership, um, is the theater that organized the world theatrical premiere of this extraordinary film, America Street. Brett. Thank you so much for having me here. I hope you can hear me. I'm having a little problem with connectivity right now. I'm, I'm, I can't hear my, uh, you or myself, but it looks like my, uh, my microphone is working. So if you can give me a thumbs up there. Okay, great. You can hear me. Very good. <laughs> Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, you know, I want to thank uh, both PCIM and FLEP for being such great partners in this effort, and certainly to Idrisu for making a remarkable film. As, uh, as Professor Judy said, uh, it is certainly going to be one that is referenced for, for many years to come. The uh, use of Charleston as, uh, as a character and as uh, the protagonist of this story is one that is um, important and uh, I think very unique. So thank you for sharing this film with us. Uh, I think my perspective on it obviously is one from sort of the, um, the industry perspective. Uh, and that is that it, this film and this release has come along at a very interesting time for independent film exhibition uh, and for independent film production. Uh, we uh, obviously are in the midst of this pandemic and it was uh, around the start of uh, our response to the pandemic that as uh, Professor Zimmerman may have mentioned, that we pivoted to something called virtual cinema, which is essentially uh, what is growing to be known as theatrical video on demand, a, a system where um, the exhibitors of independent film like Cinemopolis uh, are allowed to uh, be an intermediary between our audience, our patrons, um, and distributors in a way that is new and different from our typical relationship, which is an embodied one inside, a, inside an art house cinema. And so uh, we began offering these uh, theatrical video on demand films uh, in, uh, in would, I guess around April or early May. And then of course uh, it, it happened so, so that, it, and we got to the end of May and the, the country was uh, facing yet another uh, death of a, of a black man at the hands of law enforcement, this time George Floyd. And we used that um, as a response to that, that uh, moment 
to offer a sneak preview of this film via our virtual cinema platform. Uh, and the response was remarkable. Um, as Professor Zimmerman mentioned, I'm affiliated with the Art House Convergence, which is a, an association dedicated to um, improving and, and, uh, and, uh, and supporting independent media exhibition around the country. And I was able to share both Idrisu's great um, words and his statement on why he was making the, avail the film available as a, as a preview for free at that moment and, um, and the, uh, the link to that, to that free screening. And so very quickly it went from be, being something that was being offered via Cinemopolis to something that was being shared with this network of uh, mission-driven, community-focused um, art cinemas around North America. And within the first week, I think it was, I don't know, 7,500 views of the film. So it really um, was a remarkable uh, testament to the power of this new platform and certainly a testament to both the powerful message and the, the timeliness of the message that, um, that this film brought forth about uh, the systemic challenges that African-American communities have uh, in the United States and how those conditions uh, have continued over decades to be uh, challenging. Um, this, now this new iteration of, of be, being able to be the world's theatrical premiere is another great opportunity for both the cinema and I think our community to be seen as a, as a leader in both, in both cinema exhibition, but also in, in providing opportunities for people to use the art of film um, potentially as a tool for, for social change and betterment. And um, it, we really obviously depend greatly on artists like Idrisu to continue to, to create films like this. And so it's, uh, it's really just a, a great honor to be part of this panel today and also to be part of the, uh, of the release of the film. Thank you, Brett, so much. And um, thank you for all of your innovations in figuring out how to do a world theatrical release in this way during a time of pandemic and protest. It's clearly breaking new territory. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Janet Walker. Uh, uh, professor Janet Walker is Professor of Film and Media Studies um, and an affiliate member of the Department of Feminist Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She received a USC Santa Barbara Academic Senate Distinguished Teaching Award uh, with research specializations including documentary film and media, trauma and memory studies, and media and environment, Professor Walker is the author or editor of six extremely influential and important books in the international field of documentary studies. These books include Documentary Testimonies, Global Archives of Suffering, and sustainable media, critical approaches to media and environment. Um, she has also published numerous essays on these, uh, on these topics. Professor Walker is the recipient of a Mellon Sawyer Seminar Grant for uh, the project Energy Justice in Global Perspective. And she is co-founder of the new uh, journal Media Plus Environment. Professor Walker. Thank you so much, Professor Zimmerman, and everyone for your thoughts so far. I'm riveted. And congratulations, Mr. Idrisi Morokapai, for this absolutely extraordinary film, and then also for being with us. It's an honor for me to participate with this group. And I also had an idea that, that the idea that Professor Judy had, which was to begin my remarks where the film invites us to begin. So I also noticed the, the shot of the bridge spanning into the city, which I take to be the Ravenel Bridge spanning into Charleston. I, I see nodding, that's great. And then the next shot is the East Side neighborhood. And at that point we hear Joe Watson's voice. 
saying, we've lived here on this corner for 57 years. Then a quick shot of a sign propped in the window of a shop, America Street. And then in the fourth shot, we come face to face with Joe Watson himself in direct address telling his life and the history of the neighborhood. So it is interesting that Professor Judy broached the, the idea that it is, it is the community itself, which is the, the film's main protagonist. I think that's, that's a great idea and I'm, I immediately agree. Um, but I, I also want to note, mention that the, the film does not have an omniscient narrator or a voice of God narrator. So that Joe and his words, whether we, we see him speaking or whether we hear the words in voice over, Joe Watson in a way serves the role of the narrator and his, he's our guide and he's our, he's our moral compass. And then it's also crucially important that in addition to what he tells us about his life and about the history of the neighborhood and his, his astute analysis of systemic racism in the area, in addition to his words, we have his physical presence which lends incredible gravitas to the film. He literally leads the way through the streets and situates us in the, in the neighborhood. So I, I can see a, a reciprocal relationship between Joe guiding Mr. Idrisu Morakapai and then also uh, what, what the film gives him as an outlet. He's already an important community leader, but the film then then boosts his, his voice. And I think that this beautiful rendering of people in a place reminds me of the words of the philosopher Edward S. Casey, who wrote, it is by bodily movement that I find my way in place and take up habitation there. So this is such a, a, a gorgeous, site-specific, deeply situated film. I was glad to learn from Idrisu how he met Joe and began filming and how that all unfolded. And I'd love to hear more about that. In terms of documentary history, one possible reference point would be the work of John Grierson, the Scottish documentary uh, pioneer, as he's called in film history, who in the 1930s in Britain oversaw the creation of films about working people and meeting them where they live and where they work. For example, he oversaw the film Housing Problems, which was made in 1935. It was an early sound film, especially when it comes to location sound recording. And in that film, the, the, uh, the directors were able to meet people in their homes and hear from them in direct address. So I think that, that I would locate this, this really important film within that history, but also say there's documentary filmmaking as a, as a more than century long body of work still lacks films centered on working people. And I'm, I'm so happy to have this film in existence for that among, among so many other reasons. Grierson's ambition was to bring the citizen's eye, I'm quoting, to bring the citizen's eye from the ends of the earth to his own story, the drama of the doorstep. And America's Street seems to me very much a drama of the doorstep. But what's doubly remarkable about the film is that it also moves us out, it's outward looking from the doorstep to the wider US context of slavery history of lynching, Jim Crow segregation, and then the present inheritance of violence. There are so many telling details as we meet an artist who remarks on how so many places call themselves plantation, as if this is a claim to fame rather than a reference to an unconscionable past. And it's, it's truly appalling to, to contemplate the likelihood that a filmmaker already in a city would then encounter multiple violent events, uh, the police shooting of Walter Scott, and then also the, the perpetration of the massacre 
at the at the church by the avowed white white supremacist, and uh, I understand that nine people and di died, including the pastor Pinckney, who was also state senator Pinckney. So there's a lot to to talk about, and 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 I'm moved by these events. The residents seem to me to be already displaced in place, caught by the forces of looming gentrification and then an already extant withdrawal of resources. And I, like Professor Judy again, found the, the sequence of the community meeting to be incredible. You have that official saying, of course there needs to be diversity, but then the way the film is shot and edited, we see this chain of glances among the community members, and it really speaks volumes about how Black culture can be appropriated for tourism and how longtime residents can be pushed out. Another thing I hope we can discuss is the role of public housing. There's a very interesting, brief, but fascinating and, and informative sequence about public housing in the film. One final comment about Joe's store. Joe himself discusses the food insecurity of the families of the kids coming into his store. He says, sometimes they have money, sometimes the kids don't have money. And of course, we know that Joe Watson offers great sustenance to these kids and has done so for decades. But there are these multiple shots of Joe standing in front of shelves, arrayed with products that seem to me, um, maybe it's my, my privileged position in a small city in California where I'm literally surrounded by fresh fruits and vegetables growing. Multiple shots in front of, of Joe standing in front of these shelves arrayed with products that really do seem to evoke the problem of nutritional insecurity and the problem that, uh, that, that poor neighborhoods end up being uh, urban food deserts. So it's just astonishing how the film gets at so many issues that go to the heart of people's experience of systemic racism, but, but so subtly, so delicately, and with enormous insight and restraint and respect. I, I am so moved and, and <laughs> awe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Walker, for those uh, very poignant comments. Uh, and thank you for reminding us that the film moves from the doorsteps of the working class to the larger historical and political issues of slavery, Jim Crow, and systemic racial violence. Thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Professor Rhys Auguste. Um, uh, professor Rhys Auguste is Associate Professor of Critical Media Studies at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He is a documentary filmmaker and a scholar whose research focuses on the African diaspora, transnational screen cultures, and archival studies. He was a founding member of the critically acclaimed Black Audio Film Collective in the United Kingdom and worked on many of the collective's uh, productions. Professor Aguist directed the award-winning uh, feature-length documentaries, Twilight City, and also the uh, Mysteries of July. His current films are Duty of Honor, uh, about Benjamin Hooks, and Stillness Spirit. His essays have appeared uh, in many journals internationally, including After Image, Journal of Media Practice, Cine Action, Questions of Third Cinema, and many, many others. He is the recipient of uh, several international awards for his filmmaking, including the Joseph von Sternberg Award. Uh, Professor Aguist. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Zimmerman. Um, first of all, thank you for also um, organizing this uh, incredible event uh, today. Um, I want to begin by um, somewhat referencing what uh, Idrisi, um, Idrisi, sorry, um said uh, in his opening remarks, which was uh, that uh, America Street was not a scripted 
work. Um, and I'm glad he said that because I've been watched it a couple of times. I figured out that that wasn't a scripted film because it is so, um, it is so organic in the way in which it opens and it flows through, through the narrative. It's a very organic work in the sense that it was, uh, there is no single shot that was forced or cinematographic moment that was uh, put into a preconceived structure. And I believe the, the power of this film, both narratively um, as well as its aesthetics, um, rests in its kind of um, its organic form, the way in which it, it was put together through the editing process. Um, but I believe central to this work um, is that Joe, is the embodiment of a history. He's also the embodiment of a culture, um, and he's also the embodiment of a community. Right? So the community actually is articulated through Joe's experiences. And in that sense, Joe functions as if it, he were a, um, a West African griot, in the sense that um, he relies a lot on memory. In fact, he has a tremendous uh, reservoir of memories of, of Charleston, and in particular, his neighborhood. And uh, through his interactions with um, other members of the community, uh, he calls upon memory to actually ground the contemporary experiences of African Americans in Charleston. Um, the other important point about this film is that it, it enters into a conversation with other movies or other films. And though we would like to think of this as a documentary, and it is to a certain extent, if I could put it that way, but if we were to think of it in terms of just moving images and take away the label of documentary from this uh, uh, film, it would be very easy to make the argument that this film, in terms of the way in which it addresses questions of time, the question of space, um, that narrative form, um, it really is in conversation with films uh, such as A Daughters of the Dust by Julie Dash. It's also in conversation with the classic film by Charles Burnett, The Killer of Sheep. And it's also in conversation with even like Ozu's um, A Tokyo Story in terms of the construction of film shots uh, quite often the shots are static, long shots, medium shots, close-ups, and, uh, and occasionally there are pans. Uh, I do not see any necessarily long, long, tra long tracking shots. But the way in which he organizes uh, the film shots that presents us with different historical and contemporary perspectives of Charleston, and in doing so, he also layers the film in such a way that he reveals through pulling off layers upon layers upon layers, the historical processes that actually underpins the community of Charleston and the, um, and the presence of African-Americans historically within that city. And one of the seminal moments in that film for me was the sequence of the former slave market, which is now a kind of a tourist kind of thoroughfare. Um, and he interviews uh, 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 a gentleman that actually articulates um, the history of the building in which he now actually, you know, he, he conducts commerce. Um, and, in, and in doing so, he also reveals that Charleston, you know, was one of the major slave ports in the United States, right? In fact, one in four um, African-Americans uh, uh, had some kind of connection with the Charleston. Um, that to me was very moving because that points to a filmmaker who is not only in command of narrative, but also in command of um, the cinematographic apparatus, okay? Um, there is a moment, in fact, in that film where the, in, in that particular sequence, there is a soundtrack which is almost mournful. It's very kind of a kind of blues, jazz, kind of infused soundtrack, right? Which, you know, as a sonic, uh, you know, as a sonic structure, actually speaks to the moment of, of slavery and the memories of slavery, right? Um, that I found very, very powerful. And um, having said that, 
I would also to, like to add that um, the sequence uh, pertaining to the Emmanuel uh, um, a and church was also very powerful. And, and what I got from this movie is that it is in fact a tone poem. Um, it's like a prayer in many ways. Um, and the prayer is being recited through the historical experiences, through the memories of Joe and Joe and the wider community. And that is why I think this film will be of historical significance for film historians. Um, but also I think it's gonna be of historical si significance in terms of community activism and the way in which it is represented or its representation is constructed in this particular film. And lastly, I would just like to make uh, a, a very brief point that one of the most moving moments in this film was the community activist on the street corner who, whose political analysis of gentrification was so astute. There was such like criticality in his understanding of what was happening with his community that I would actually place his analysis next to that of many scholars of urban spaces, right? Um, and it is that kind of like, that kind of critical um, sort of apparatus, right? That many people do not associate with a guy like this or this particular, you know, this particular man. I mean, you'd walk past him on the street and you wouldn't think that he actually has that kind of, you know, that kind of command of critical analysis of his committee, but he does, right? And that again, I think was, um, is, uh, that actually speaks to, uh, to the filmmakers, like ability to, to see something as unique as that and place it within the film and it kind of blends into the broader narrative uh, flow of this work. So thank you so much for making this wonderful film, Jerusalem. Uh, thank you, Professor Aguist. And uh, thank you for pointing out how uh, the layers of the historical process are articulated in the cinematic and uh, your observation that the movie is like a prayer, um, uh, very, very powerful. Uh, before we open it to our audience, I have a few questions for all the panelists. And, um, and it seems that every uh, panelist uh, brought up issues of aesthetics, structure and politics. So I'd like to take each one of those. And uh, if we could just start, uh, if I could ask um, um, for any panelists to elaborate a little more on the um, unique uh, aesthetics of this film, particularly in the shooting style, the um, cinematography that has um, uh, such repose to it and that insists on uh, community. Um, I was struck by how so many of the panelists uh, went into a very deep dive into the visual construction of the film. So um, um, any thoughts on the aesthetics, on the visual strategies in the film uh, that anyone would like to elaborate? Just jump right in. All right. Yeah. Um, this is a hallmark of Idrisu's uh, filmmaking. Um, he did this in Arif in the scene, uh, and it's one of the things that uh, uh, Reese spoke to. Uh, these unscripted films in which somehow the camera becomes a participant in the community. And in the shots, there's a very specific temporality. Even the way he uses cut shots, follows a very specific rhythm that parallels the rhythm of the community that's being discussed. Here, there's a very specific blues rhythm, right? A very powerful 4-4, constant all the way through. And, and I began to pay attention to how the cut shots kept doing this, because we have all of these, these tight, fixed shots, and then there's cuts, and there's cuts, and a collage effect is, is cheap. But more importantly, it really puts us in the temporality of the community, right? So the camera is a participant and we become a participant. He did the same thing with, with a different temporality because of course now it's the desert in Niger, right? So there's, there's a definite aesthetic 
attitude that these two brings to his filmmaking, which as I said before, and I agree with Reese, I mean, this is, you, you find this with, with Barnett's work, you found this with AJ, AJ shooting of Dash's film, Dust in the Dawn, that I would even go as far as to characterize as having a very specific black aesthetic to it, in, in the most copious sense of that, of that term. Uh, Reese, did you want to pick up on the shooting style and then? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think Janet? again, I mean, I think again, just from a kind of a film uh, history perspective, um, uh, again, I'm going back to the fact that it was unscripted, kind of reminded me of the best of neorealist cinema, you know, of neorealism as, uh, as a mode of filmmaking, but also as a mode of aesthetic, um, of aesthetic register. Right. And in addition to that, I would like to add that if we, if we want to talk about the aesthetics of the film, we could actually place many of the scenes of this film into the aesthetic of the sublime, uh, which is where I think um, a lot of the film's power actually rests. Right. Uh, again, I keep going back to the market uh, 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 in, in downtown Charleston, which is once a slave market. Uh, that is actually a very sublime uh, sequence in this movie. And it gets even more sublime when you get to the end, it, to the church, and you actually hear the voice of, of, of Reverend Pinckney. And then you actually see him. And then immediately, you actually get the kind of text on the screen, which says, this is where this is what happened here, you know, like nine, nine lives were lost in this church uh, taken by white supremacists, including that of the Reverend, right? Those are sublime moments and, and the sublime in aesthetics is, is, is foundational in the philosophy of the arts. It's one of the foundational like paradigms. Um, and I see that being almost central to the work. It works on a very kind of subliminal level because I think Idrisu holds the shot. And because I think in terms of the, of the time, you know, the, like time duration is what actually makes this film very compelling. It forces the audience to actually watch and to listen. And in doing so, that's where I think the aesthetic power of the film also rests. Janet, did you want to add to that? Thank you, I would. Well, just to jump back from the broader media perspective here, imagine a journalist given the assignment to make a film about this African-American neighborhood and the, the forces that impinge upon it. You could well imagine the choice to go to a series of experts and interview these various experts who could be the mayor or, you know, official, any kind of officials. And then you could interview some professors in their offices. And uh, so you'd have all these uh, expert testimonies or, or, or expert words of wisdom. And then you would go out and find what I have heard called B-roll. So then you would get the whole environment, the whole community and everything, and that would be your B-roll. And so then you would be able to cut that together and you would go from expert to the place, another expert to the place. So this film is the opposite of that way. Uh, the, the, the wisdom and the knowledge bubble up from the community. And I think that is of crucial importance. Of course, when you're making an unscripted film, there, there's going to be some pattern to it. And in cinema verite, where you're, you're getting people to speak to the camera in direct address, as I was saying, and then you're also observing, you sometimes have the choice of following a person and let, let that lend shape, or, or being in a place, like with the films of Frederick Wiseman, where he will film um, in a... Uh, uh, an institution for the criminally insane, as in Titicate Follies, or, or at a hospital. And then the place becomes the protagonist, and then characters define themselves as they pass through. But this film really roots 
the, 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 the people in the place of the neighborhood and they actually co-constitute the neighborhood and this argument of, of anti-racism that the film stands so strongly uh, for. Uh, thank you. And Adrisu, would you uh, like to uh, perhaps respond about your shooting strategy and some of the comments? Um, we can't hear you, Adrisu. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. No, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear what, uh, what uh, has been said, right? And while making your film, you don't think of, you know, about all these aspects in making. It's, it's kind of like that, right? I'm, uh, I'm kind of filmmaker that uh, I even don't, don't use the word uh, aesthetic, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just it's a film, you have a, an intention and then you do it. And uh, uh, I mean, you just follow, follow a certain rhythm, right? And that's uh, what happened in Charleston. When I was there, it's, uh, I, it, I was so captivated by what is happening, by my character, Joe. And uh, I, even, I mean, the material, the gears was not important. I just took what I had in my possession, which a uh, camera, a small camera. It was not, it was zero key <laughs> camera, right? Uh, today, we, people talk about 4K, 6, 6K uh, in classes. My camera was very simple. And, uh, uh, and uh, as I said at the beginning, I was alone. So, and the aesthetics, um, of the form, the structure of the film itself came really uh, during the editing. You, know, you have a, 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 you know, hours, many hours of material and you try to give a sense to a narration, right? Uh, so um, for all of my film, the editing process are longer than the process of the making the process, right? The, the writing and production, the editing really takes months. Right, that's uh, imagine I shot this film in 2015. It's not about only money, it's ab about also finding a, a structure of the film, right? So um, it's interesting. I really, I was uh, amazed to find all, <laughs> to, to hear all what is being said about uh, the aesthetic, about the meaning you, you give to every, you know, uh, every shot in this film. But as a filmmaker, you, I, I don't think it's the, you know, it's your concern really. It's just you do it. You want to talk uh, to the audience, and if all the, your audience understand what you you mean, that's uh, that's your goal. Really, you reach your goal. Um, and I think you reached your goal given what people have been analyzing today in America it's Street. A, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to go to the, the Q&A. And this is a question about structure because um, literally everybody who spoke brought up the question of structure, that this is a film um, about people in place and it's not a character, individual character driven film. And that uh, this is a work, um, of layers and layers, and also um, a work that is um, using um, uh, a different structure um, rather than just a strict narrative structure. Um, so it's a film of people, place, environment, creating a web, uh, creating layers. And I wonder if we could um, ask our panelists to um, to explain a little more about the significance of this kind of, um, of structure. And I, I think I'll go to you, Professor Judy, because you gave us an insight that part of the rhythm and structure is the blues. <laughs> Quite a question. <laughs> the use and the significance of the structure. You know, there's not much I could add to it. To what uh, Professor uh, Aguist has said. Um, and we, we keep making the same references to the, uh, the, uh, the film that, that Americans speaks in conversation with. Um, 
I wouldn't have said that those moments line as much as those are moments of a profound oxymoronic nature. Uh, and that's a very particular blues structure if you follow the way like Albert Murray uh, has talked about and understood the blues. And in that regard, the structure is, as I said before, much what I would call a black structure, even to focus on the question of how Joe speaks, he's the voice. But what I was reminded of was what Leon Talley said recently, the fashion editor at Vogue, about his growing up in the South and how people would hang around on the veranda, cousins, uncles, aunts, grandparents, and they would tell stories. And that it was a world of storytelling, a world of narration, where the structure of narrative, life sustaining, life making. And in the film, the camera does this structurally. It's not just Joe who's talking, but we're seeing Joe telling stories who are telling stories. Okay. And, and uh, uh, the significance of that structure in terms of, 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 of film is it contributes again to a very particular style uh, uh, of, of black filmmaking. Which Idris Idrisu doesn't require that one thinks such theoretical terms as aesthetics, but but in the performing it is actually bringing it about. Yes, the strategy of how the camera is in these places with these people. But again, it's unscripted. The strategy has to do with the way in which Idrisu in his film in his films is so focused on on trying to be in the place with the people and have the camera be a participant, right? That uh, 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 the strategy is gonna flow. And, and you know, I happen to know, I looked over his shoulder, a lot of the narrative comes in the editing, right? And, and, and that editing pays very much attention to the ways in which the camera, I wanna speak carefully, uh, because this is a cinematographic work that is given, it has considerable thought and art to it, out of years of experience, in which the camera is, Oddly, and that's why I said oxymoronic, for the fixed shots, right? For all of the, the head shots with the minimum scanning shots. For all of its fixedness, fixedness, right? The camera is unmoored. And it, it doesn't emulate that aspect of verite, where there's a jerkiness and a movement, right? You never lose sight of the fact that there's indeed a camera here. Uh, and and so strategically that 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 achieves the affect that we have we've all expressed it before, right? <clears throat> uh, uh, maybe one more panelist on uh, the question of structure. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Walker. Thank you. Well, when I saw the film and saw the film and and thought about it, I assumed wrongly that uh, Idrisu was drawn to the city by the police shooting of Walter Scott, and then went to the store and met up with Joe Watson, and then the uh, white supremacist massacre at the church occurred. And so I was just horrified to find out that during this three month period, while Idrisu was already in the city. These two catastrophic uh, atrocities were perpetrated. But so again, thinking about what you would have if you had a, a mainstream film about this, you could have a sensationalized view of violence in the city, something like that. But in, in this film, instead, those two anchor points of the structure of the film are very subtly handled. And I really appreciated hearing what the, the people in the store thought about the, the killing of Walter Scott and how it all happened because of child support, lack of child support payments, and then how that elicited the story from Joe about his own situation. And so I really love how the film, yes, it acknowledges this violence and puts it into the history 
of, of slavery and, and everything that transpired since then. Yes, and it's, it's certainly given deep attention, but it's also brought back to the everyday lives of people in the community and what it means to be in a community where you, you end up being shot when you need to or feel you need to flee because you realize you've gone afoul of the law. So there is quite a bit of conversation in the film, but here and there, about the incarceration, the, you know, the disproportionate incarceration of African Americans. But I, I really appreciate how it always it comes back to the everyday lives of people and how they, they, they relate it to things going on. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the reminder of uh, the focus here on racialized everyday lives. Um, uh, That's a perfect segue to some of our audience and participants' questions. And um, this is a question uh, to uh, Professor Maura Kapai, the director of the film, from Professor Allison Frisch, who's a professor of journalism at Ithaca College. She asks, can you please talk about the ways Walter Scott and Reverend and then Senator Clementa Pickney inform the film? especially because they are no longer with us. Um, and then their relationship to Joe Watson in the film. Um, she shares, we watched the film days ago and we are still thinking about and feeling the connections there. So um, um, Professor Mora Kapai, might you um, share a little bit of your thoughts about uh, Walter Scott, Clement on Pickney, Yes, I mean, uh, I I was shooting uh, in uh, in the store actually when the news came to the store. Actually, that's the part of the film where you don't edit it, right? Uh, I was filming. I have a shot like that when somebody came and informed Joe what happened. Right, and uh, and the feed, as I said, you know, I was shooting every day. That means the community, anything that happened to the community, Joe was the first first person to be informed, right? So, um, what is Scott Kane uh, was kind of uh, um, that was not part of, of of my film. That was not, but I mean, I'm shooting as you said. Uh, uh, the city was the character was a character of, of this film. I cannot ignore anything that happened in the, you know, in the city. So I was automatically, you know, taken to the place where that happened. So I, for me, that was kind of, I mean, for a filmmaker, that was a sad, a sad, uh, uh, a sad thing that could happen, but at the same time, it's, it's a gift for the film, actually, right? That allowed me to explore topic that I, do, I didn't want to explore just with word, just with uh, you know, Joe talking about that or, or you know, another character talking about the violence. So that's uh, really uh, something that say, many documentary maker will, tell, will say, say, that is uh, what we call a gift for the film. It's a very sad gift but, uh, for the film to be able to explore this violence that was really. So with the, with the church, um, also, uh, I, the church, I was not there, just to correct this part, I was not there when uh, the nine people got killed. And I was there before. And I left Charleston on June 8th, and uh, the killings has happened uh, just a, one week after the killing. And in June, I've been in the church with Joe. <laughs> I filmed to the pastor. And I got the information after I left. Joe was the first person to call me and to give me this information, what happened, you know, in, in Shasta. You know, you've been with me in this, in this place. You know what happened? The pastor got killed and we found nine other people. So that's uh, really uh, something just... I cannot ignore in this film also these, you know, events, these sad events. 
right? That's part of my, my, my story. I think that was really important also to, um, uh, to explore. Right? So I don't, I don't know if I, uh, I understood very well the question of Alison. So, uh, I think you did an excellent job. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, um, this is a, a, a another question. Um, and I, I think many of our panelists have uh, addressed this, but um, I think it's, it's worth uh, asking it again. This is coming from a student, Ben Bassam. And he asks this, um, does being a documentary filmmaker instead of a journalist affect your relationship with the people in the area while you're filming? Um, were the people more or less hesitant uh, to you while you were filming them? Um, Adrisu, perhaps a yeah. brief answer here to oh, yeah. Yeah, that's explicate it. differences between your documentary style and, and a, a, a kind style. of helicopter journalism. Yeah, I mean, that was really interesting especially for, for that, because I mean, the shooting, I mean, my, the filmmaking happened, you know, during this, uh, you know, two sad event, the killing of Walter Scott, and then now uh, uh, the church, so the killings and the massacre in the church. You know, when, while shooting Walter Scott event, more than 50 journalists that came from around the world, right? You know, all of them were in the town. They, they were meeting people, interviewing people in the town. And then after a week, all of them disappear, right? So, I mean, what make a difference between a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker filming a, a city like a Charleston and a filming and coming to, to just interview people is that when you interview people, people don't trust you. When you don't stay, people don't trust you. They will just reply to your question. Uh, it doesn't mean that what they say it's what, I mean, <laughs> what they think, right? It may be, it might be uh, that they say what you want to hear or what you want to inform to your audience. But to be able to make a film, to hear them, to receive what they say, you need to stay because people need trust. They won't trust you. Who are you, right? Why should I tell you my story, my private story? So that make a big difference. You know, when I first came, when I first met Joe, he told me everything just in one day. He didn't understand that I was a documentary filmmaker. He thought I was a journalist. And then say, I'm coming back tomorrow. He say, for what? <laughs> he say, I told you everything about me, <laughs> about myself. <laughs> and I, I had to explain it. He say, I'm not a journalist, Joe. Uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker, and he wanted to know what make the difference between journalists. And I'm going to come tomorrow. Uh, you don't have to talk to me. I'm going to stay here. And for three days, I was, you know, I continued coming. And he asked me again. He said, "When are we going to finish?" And I say, "I don't know. <laughs> I don't know when we finish." So after a week, I mean, they forgot me. I was part of, of the community. I was part of the store, right? So even, I mean, the community member, other member who never, I mean, came to the store, knew about me, knew I was filming in the community. You know, people would stop and say, are you Idrisu? Yeah, I heard about you, <laughs> right? And that, so that was really what made me different. And I've been there, as I said, for three months, right? So, um, I mean, a documentary filmmaker, I think, is, you know, you connect to people forever. You stay, you know, you share the life of the people, not just for your film, but for, for your entire life. You know, I'm connected to Joe now. <laughs> Joe is a part of, is a, like a family member, right? So that makes a difference. I'm not there just to, you know, to, to get the information and go. You know, I'm there because I was really, I, uh, just, you know, I wanna know, I, I'm very concerned about what they were going through, right? Um, thank you so much um, for, for sharing the before, during and after story of the uh, process of really collaborating 
with uh, Joe and the people in this community. Right. Um, there is um, another uh, question, and we'll do about two or three more questions just to prepare panelists for the takeaway that's coming up. Uh, this is from Professor Stuart A. Ash, uh, Professor of Public Health at Ithaca College. He says, Professor Walker, uh, you mentioned the question of public housing briefly. I wonder how and why you connected it to the film in Charleston. Um, and um, uh, he adds a comment, for so long, public housing has been a means of promoting systematic racism, mm -hmm. despite its promise of providing a benefit. Yeah. Thank you for that question. In the film, we, we're in the car, I believe this is right, we're in the car with Joe Watson, and he drives by a housing project. And I believe, and Professor Morika Pai can correct me on this, that it must have been one of the projects built in Charleston in the 1930s. And then Joe Watson tells a story about how he was taking a girl home and he got in three fights when he was passing through the project, so he learned to go around. And I thought that was really <laughs> the nitty gritty experience and, and interesting. But but public housing, um, though it's, it's so often thought of as a site of criminal activity, it's also a, a place where working people live. And um, it, it did represent at a certain point in time under the WPA, the infusion of resources into a certain community. So after, say in New Orleans, after Katrina, although the public housing wasn't particularly damaged, the people had to leave. And then, and then there was that um, moment where their, the fact of their absence and the fact of the hurricane was used to raise the project. And I, uh, you know, this, the film inspired me to do some research on this because I, I know now that, yes, the federal resources that had gone into the city of Charleston for public housing are now being um, uh, with, well withdrawn in favor of public, local public authorities. And uh, if this follows the pattern of public housing elsewhere, it could be the case that um, the, the, the projects could be, could be torn down. And in the end, they, there could be less Section 8 housing even if it's mixed housing, but less Section 8 housing. So it could be a way to contribute to gentrification. So I think it's really interesting that the film doesn't necessarily, at that point in time, doesn't necessarily share Joe's view, but locates public housing within this broader history of the transition, uh, transitions that are happening in the city. I also, by the way, wonder what's going to happen uh, should sea level rise affect this area because it is a, a neighborhood close to the coast. So I guess I, if that was a meandering answer, but I, oh, I'm you. really concerned with what's going to happen in the city in terms of the ability of the community to, to keep itself together and still afford to live there. Thank you. Um, there are two questions, and I'd like to, uh, one for Brett Bossard and one for Adriso, and I'd like to ask you both to be a little brief because we'll need to, uh, after that, move to our takeaways. Uh, it's a question for Brett. If you could um, share a little bit about why a world theatrical premiere uh, on virtual cinema is a change from the way independent documentaries might have rolled out before the pandemic? Oh, well, yeah, sure. It's, a, it's, it's quite a change, obviously. Um, a, because it's, it's virtual, as we've said, but, but certainly um, independent documentaries would have uh, typically followed a, a more traditional track of, of festival releases, followed potentially by a, um, you know, by a platform release in starting in, in some major markets, in this case, maybe in, in Charleston as well, um, you know, screening at a theater in, in, the, in the community. Um, so certainly this is a, a large change for both distribution and for exhibition. Um, but, I, you know, in some ways, I think we're, we're 
we're in the lemonade business these days, right? We've, we've been handed a, a big bushel of lemons in, in, the, in, the, in the closure of movie theaters. And so um, this pivot to changing our, our methods of distribution of film have created some opportunities. And I do think, um, you know, many more, potentially thousands more people uh, have been exposed to this amazing story um, when it's still sort of, you know, fresh in this way um, than would, would have been normally when it was more confined to something like a, a festival circuit or, or a few major markets. So the hope is that um, we're gonna learn from some of these changes to the way this business operates and uh, and be a little bit more inclusive and equitable when it comes to the way that uh, certain stories are being told and shared with large audiences around the country. Um, it's kind of an exciting time, as, as much as it is uh, terrifying, it's kind of an exciting time to be in exhibition. <laughs> it is. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, making le lemonade out of lemons. Uh, one last question for uh, Adrisu Morakapai, and I, I'd like to ask you to be short so we can do the uh, takeaways immediately after. Uh, and this is from Professor Jennifer Stover from Binghamton University. And she asks, uh, it's a good follow-up to Brett. Uh, how has the community in Charleston received your film? Have you been able to show it there? Adrisu. Yes, I, 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 I've, been to, I've been in November, uh, in November to screen the film in Charleston. Uh, I was uh, invited by College of Charleston to screen the film there, and that was really uh, very huge. Uh, there, there were, I mean, half of the people couldn't enter, uh, to, I mean, couldn't get a place to, to see the film. That was really, right? and also um, the free screening that uh, we organized with the Cinema Police and PLEF and, uh, and uh, Park Center uh, for independent media. Uh, has been largely also uh, watched from Charleston. I mean, I got so many <laughs> emails from people from South Carolina, not, not only uh, Charleston. So that's uh, people who are very interested and there are still people who want to see this film from, from Charleston. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, clearly the film has um, had both a local reception in Charleston as well as this massive uh, international exhibition uh, right now with the world theatrical premiere. We're going to move to the takeaway session as we wrap up this um, extraordinary uh, panel. And I'd like to ask each panelist to share a minute or two of uh, takeaways. And um, I'm going to go in reverse order of the speakers. So um, Professor Mora Kapai. Yeah. Um so, I mean, my, my takeaways take are really, it's huge. Um, you know, after the project is made, you, you never know if your intention are understood by your audience, by people you show the film. And uh, all the good things I heard today are really inspiring. <laughs> so I never, <laughs> never imagined that uh, the film could be uh, such a... a, 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 a I mean, a discussion, a, dis a discussion topic like, like that. You do your film, you just, I mean, uh, do it. You, you follow a character and that to see how many aspects that have been, you know, uh, discussed to tonight, it's, uh, it's, for me, it's amazing. Really. So I thank you so much for, for your contribution. And uh, one thing I want to add is also the new opportunities that really came through this online, uh, online screening. For us filmmaker, you know, uh, independent filmmaker, it's something important, right? You know, Brad, as Brad said, you know, making a film, finishing a film is one thing, but to get it to a distribution is another, <laughs> another struggle. You know, you have to go through all these festival cycles, and but it's not guaranteed that you can get you can get your film to do, to be distributed. So this pandemic and what happened with what we organize here in in, in Ithaca, it's uh, something completely new. It's an opportunity that we have to you know give us kind of hope really as an independent filmmaker. Thank you, uh, Professor Judy. 
Yes, um, the takeaway for me is that um, uh, we see with this film and the way it has been presented on virtual cinema, uh, the impact virtual cinema is going to have. Uh, the which it, it, it brings important work to a broader public. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Brett Bossard. Uh, boy, well, to take away from me, I think, uh, particularly, you know, hearing some of the great speakers uh, certainly made me reconsider sort of, I think, Idrisu, maybe you undersell your, your uh, aesthetic, uh, because I do think they're, they're, the, the act of editing and inclusion, inclusion of the, the camera as a character was something that was really, uh, you know, it was quite evocative of being in the community. And I think because of your intimate and compassionate focus on this community during this period in time, um, this will be uh, a, a historical document to show, much like the way uh, the film Who Streets did, the real evolution of the Black Lives Matter movement um, and how it, it, how it was informed by and grew in different communities around the country as they were affected by uh, the racial injustices that continue in America. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to see the the next life this film has uh, as something important to show where we're going and where we've been. Thank you, Brett. And uh, now we're going to Professor Walker. Thank you. Well, I'm going to circle back to the beginning with Professor Judy's comment that the community is the protagonist. Um, I was I was quite struck by that, and it it feels right. And then I learned so much from this conversation and uh, Professor Adri Sumora Kapai's comments about the time frame of filming and the commitment to Joe Watson, the life commitment to to be in touch and to to think of him and to to incorporate one another into your respective lives. So that I guess what I now have come to understand in a new way is, is the way in which if the community is the protagonist, then the violence is pervasive and endemic. And even though there are these horrifying acts of violence that the film is about, the way in which it, it's systemic, racialized, anti-African-American violence that has impoverished the people of this neighborhood and, and people um, people uh, in, in many other uh, towns and cities in the U.S. And so this film about America's street is really um, about America's streets and cities. And I, I understand that in a new way by talking about the, the time frame of the film and its structure and um, the, the various elements that people have, have mentioned. So I, I, I'm also so glad that the the people in the neighborhood are, are, are analytically um, um, just so activist, astute, wise, and they have something to say to everybody. And I, I'm so glad for the existence of this film. Thank you. Um, Professor Aguis? Yes, um, my takeaway is that this film, America Street, is a social document um, in the sense that it is a document, it documents a, um, a history, a community, uh, community members, co community like struggles and cohesion. But most importantly, in order to produce such a document demands time, effort, and diligence. Um, it's a mode of filmmaking that sadly is being lost, but I'm happy to know that it is alive in Idrisu, that he took the time to, in a way, um, wear Charleston as if it were a jacket on his back and to absorb the history and the culture and the social and political sentiments of the community and then gave it back to the world as something quite unique. And for that reason, I believe this film uh, is not of, 
only not only of immense uh, historical significance, but it's going to resonate um, in the future um, because it's also a document of a city in transition and the slow um, erasure of um, of black of a black community through the processes of gentrification. Thank you. Thank you. And before I conclude, I'd like to go back to Idrisu Morakapai, the director of this extraordinarily complex and deeply humanistic and urgent, urgently political film, America Street. Um, if you might have a closing word, uh, Idrisu. Oh, oh yes, I, my closing word is to really to thank you Ray, for organizing this, to, for making really this garden here today uh, possible. And thank you all of you, uh, Professor Zimmerman, Professor Walker, Professor August, Professor Judy, and thanks also to Brad, uh, Bossa, to Raza, and to all our friends, Ari, and all of the people, Brandy, Jeremy, uh, thank you so much uh, for organizing this. And uh, uh, yes, I mean, I'm very I'm thankful, really, for all your intervention. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Adrisu. Yeah. And um, I'd like to just wrap it up a little bit here. But of course, a film of this deep complexity and such a... Um, a perceptive vision is impossible to wrap up in a minute and it, impossible to mine all of the beauty and depth and profundity of this film in 90 minutes. Um, I'd like to um, express my um, deepest thanks to the panelists for navigating us through uh, the new quadrant which has emerged for us. And that quadrant is the rethinking of documentary practice. Um, the second part of that quadrant is the new racialized environments that films, documentaries operate in of community and collaboration. And the uh, labyrinths of this which demand our attention. And the third quadrant, third side um, of the quadrant, the pandemic of COVID that has changed everything in how we think about the role and purpose of documentary and how we roll those films out into the world in new inventive exhibition practices. And the fourth quadrant of racial injustice in the United States, it's a long legacy, the way it is embedded in our communities and in its architecture and in its people. And the uh, racial protests that we are um, experiencing in America now, all of this shows us a new environment for documentary that this film so deeply uh, enters into and leads a way through. I like to extend my deepest thanks to uh, uh, Professor Rhys Auguiste, Professor Janet Walker, Brett Bossard from Cinemopolis, uh, Professor R.A. Judy from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, to Cinemopolis for leading the way in inventing new ways to put documentaries into the world and into larger conversations beyond where those theaters are located. And particularly, I'd like to thank Idrisu Morakapai for this extraordinary film that has moved us all to great depths and great heights in this uh, webinar today. And finally, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for joining us. Uh, we are um, honored by your presence and mo moved to action by your questions. I'd like to ask all the panelists and production crew to please stay on the Zoom um, uh, uh, while we wait for the attendees to leave. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you at our next event soon. <laughs>